Good morning. Um, thank you everyone for joining and welcome to Peer Economic Seminar. So today the topic is going to be the developing Asia's economic outlook and global spillover from Federal Reserve Monetary Policy by Gabriel Ciminelli. So let me introduce him. Um, so Gabriel is an economist in the Economic Research and Development Impact Department of the Asian Development Bank or ADB. His expertise lies in economic policy analysis, macroeconomic forecasting, and in general economic research. His work spans a range of topics including fiscal policy, international finance, structural reforms, labor markets, and political economy. So pri prior to the ADB, he hold a position at the IMF, the OECD, and the Asia School of Business. He holds a PhD in economics from the University of Amsterdam and Tinbergen Institute. And for today's presentation, we'll have uh, 40 minutes um, and then 20 minutes Q&A. But if you have any question, feel free to raise your hand and ask the question along the way. Thank you. Thank you, Tanisa and uh, Mila for inviting me today and for to everyone for being here to listen to this talk. So I'll, I'll go straight to the meet. So starting with the recent developments in um, developing Asia, uh, we have seen growth momentum uh, remain so, remaining solid um, in the first half of this year relative to uh, the second half of last year. The growth rate has been uh, the same, but there have been some developments uh, noteworthy. Exports growth has, has contributed positively to overall growth. Uh, whereas consumption has decreased. This is overall in developing Asia. Uh, this trend, uh, I, uh, however, is partly driven by the PRC, where uh, weakness in the property sector and uh, stagnant, uh, actually declining uh, consumer confidence are, has reduced uh, consumption. Uh, if we look uh, at developing Asia, excluding the PRC, we see that consumption has contributed more to growth in the, in the first half of this year than in the second half of last year. And we saw increasing contribution of exports, both in uh, developing Asia, excluding the PRC, and in the PRC itself. So export uh, is a robust driver of growth so far. Uh, India continues to be the fastest growing economy in uh, developing Asia, uh, notwithstanding a small decline in uh, investment and uh, of growth overall, mostly due to a change in uh, statistical discrepancy. Uh, strong growth also in uh, high income technology exporters in East Asia, uh, driven again by exports, uh, whereas uh, for Southeast Asia, we have seen uh, maybe it's one of the few uh, areas that have seen a decline in the contribution of exports growth. Now, zooming in on exports, uh, we see the uh, semiconductor cycle and the electronics export overall to uh, to contribute the most to the to the increase in uh, in exports growth, and uh, obviously this is benefiting particularly economies in East Asia. Uh, and uh, should eventually benefit also Southeast Asian economies, which are uh, in the value chain of uh, semiconductors. Um, you can see, however, that in the in the right hand side chart, that uh, also exports of other uh, goods have been increasing. Uh, and um, if we look at uh, uh, the 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 Republic of the PRC. Uh, electronics uh, is just a small part of the uh, export growth. Um, if, you, if we look at the rest of developing Asia, excluding uh, the PRC and uh, high income technology exporters, uh, we see uh, also their uh, exports uh, growing uh, this year. Now, turning to inflation, um, inflation is continuing to moderate and uh, is actually close uh, to uh, pre-pandemic, uh, actually is below pre-pandemic levels. If you look at uh, uh, the left-hand side the chart, 2% uh, in July of 2024, 
these uh, decrease uh, below uh, pre-pandemic levels is driven uh, by the PRC again, where inflation has been weak on weak consumption and uh, in general negative uh, sentiment. Um, if we look at uh, developing Asia, excluding the PRC on the right hand side, uh, we see that uh, inflation is anyway just a little bit above pre-pandemic trend, but has declined significantly uh, from the highs of the uh, after the, the pandemic and uh, and with the energy shock. Energy inflation, uh, the contribution of energy inflation as, is is now very modest in the in the gray areas in the gray bar. Uh, food inflation has been uh, is still contributing a lot to uh, uh, overall inflation, but has also decreased. And the core inflation is now below uh, pre-pandemic level, so core excluding uh, energy and uh, and uh, food items. Obviously, the lower inflation has important implications for monetary policy. Uh, now, many economies have uh, an inflation rate that is uh, uh, around the target level among those that uh, target inflation, and we see that in the in the left and uh, side chart. Um, I think as of uh, the issue, of the the launch of the ADO, which was uh, two weeks ago, um, um, there were actually last week only, there were 12 economies that had started uh, uh, easing interest rates uh, in the face of declining inflation and on the expectation of uh, uh, reduction in the interest rates by the Federal Reserve. Um, obviously, that has materialized uh, two weeks ago, so we expect and, and we expect more economies to in the region to reduce uh, uh, the policy rate. In the right hand uh, chart, uh, you see um, exchange rate uh, uh, movements versus the dollar on the y-axis and uh, uh, differential in interest rates versus U.S. yields on the x-axis uh, between essentially in the month of August. So that was before um, the cut in the in the federal funds rate by the Federal Reserve. But you see that m most of these econ most of the economies here have uh, witnessed uh, appreciating uh, currencies and uh, increases uh, in the interest rate differential. And that was driven by expectations of uh, interest rate cut by the Federal Reserve. And uh, now that you know the, the easing cycle has started, uh, assuming these, these economies will not reduce interest rates, we could see these dynamics uh, uh, continue. But uh, the other option, of course, is to, is to also reduce interest rates in, in the region. And that should affect positively uh, growth. Uh, now, turning to the forecast for this year and next year, uh, we uh, slightly upgraded uh, this year forecast to 5.0% uh, uh, from 4.9% um, and maintained at 4.9% uh, for next year. This is relative to the April edition of the Asian Development Outlook. Um, you see, however, that uh, again, the PRC, what's going on in the PRC is very important. Uh, now, if I, yeah, so here we have pre-pandemic, uh, pre-pandemic uh, pre average, 2015, 2019, and then uh, 2023, and then 2024 and 2025 forecast. We see that for developing Asia overall, we are quite uh, below about one percentage point below pre-pandemic. But if we exclude the PRC, we are exactly at pre-pandemic level. So again, the PRC is holding, is driving uh, the, the, the overall picture. Here, so you see that, that for the PRC, growth is uh, quite uh, below pre-pandemic. And then the, this is uh, offset partly by India, which instead is growing faster than the pre-pandemic. Another region that is growing faster is uh, Central Asia. Uh, and uh, and uh, South Asia, but actually no, South Asia is, there are other economies, Bangladesh, Pakistan, which are doing worse than before the pandemic. And so they are about uh, the same level. Southeast Asia, which may is interest to, uh, to you, is still a bit below the pre-pandemic, uh, but uh, we are uh, forecasting an inc increase in, in growth uh, in this year and the next. Um, now, uh, I'll move on to the to the risks uh, to the outlook, uh, but uh, as Tanita said before, feel free to interrupt at any time if you have uh, questions. So, in the 
in the ADO, we, outlaw, we outline four key risks. Uh, one is rising protectionism and uh, trade uh, uh, tariff bar barriers. Um, if uh, the outcome of uh, the U.S. presidential, depending on the outcome of the U.S. presidential election, without that I make any political statement, but uh, there could be an increase in uh, tariff uh, of imports from the PRC and more general for imports into the U.S. So that, of course, would have a, a dampening effect on uh, on the outlook for uh, developing Asia. Another big risk that we are seeing partly playing out uh, as we speak is geopolitical tensions. There are two or maybe three even major wars going on uh, in uh, in Europe and uh, another one that is um, now escalating in the Middle East. Just today there was an increase in the oil price of about 5% on concerns that uh, there could be disruptions to the oil supply. So Higher energy costs are uh, another risk to our projections, both for inflation on the upside and for growth on the downside. Um, we also highlight uh, further fr fragility in the PRC, uh, which can uh, further weaken consumer sentiment. Um, in, in our projection, we assume that there is a significant support, fiscal and uh, monetary support uh, in the PRC, and that's why we are maintaining a, uh, you know, the same, uh, uh, we are not re revising down the growth forecast. If this support fails to materialize or is not enough, that could weigh down uh, on the PRC and therefore on the whole uh, region. And then finally, another risk is weather-related events. Uh, El, El Nino is, is finished uh, and there is a high uh, probability that there is La Nina uh, coming, uh, coming in. Um, that would uh, uh, probably lead to higher rainfalls, which should boost uh, the production of uh, agricultural commodities. But if rainfall is a lot, there could be also flooding, uh, and that could uh, be a downside risk. That is a downside risk um, to the outlook. Finally, in the April edition of the ADO, we highlighted the risk of uh, higher for longer U.S. interest rates. Now, on that side, uh, the risks are more balanced uh, because we could still have uh, inflation surprises in the U.S., which would lead to which will delay further easing of monetary policy. But we could also see downside surprises, uh, which could uh, 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 increase, actually accelerate the uh, the easing cycle. And that is actually the theme of the analytical chapter that we introduced in the, this edition of the ADO and on which I am uh, going to present today, and it will take most of the, uh, most of the uh, talk. Um, so I'm now switch on to the, uh, to the analytical chapter. Uh, this is titled, Letting the Data Speak, Global Spillovers of Data-Dependent Federal Reserve Monetary Policy. Um, in this slide, you have a motivation uh, of why we are looking at this. Um, as you know, uh, the monetary policy in the U.S. has become very data dependent. That means that is that future policy actions depend on how uh, the labor market and inflation evolve relative to the Fed targets. And uh, you know, in in this quote here by Powell in the recent Jackson Hole speech, uh, you you have direct evidence of this. He, he essentially signals that. Uh, it was, that was in August that the easing cycle has started. Time has come for policy to adjust. But then he says timing and pace of rate cuts will depend on incoming data. So incoming data inform uh, future monetary policy. And that's why in this chapter we are going to look at how financial markets uh, across the world react to uh, uh, U.S. Uh, data. Here on the right hand side chart, you see the frequency of data dependent related keywords in speeches by federal FOMC governors. And there is a clear increasing trend over time. So it's not just in the current uh, juncture that uh, that monetary policy is very data dependent, but at least they, they are emphasizing since a few years that uh, monetary policy is, is uh, data dependent. But as we will see, there are variations of data dependency over time. Uh, we will see that uh, uh, in the next slide. Uh, but overall, the trend seems to be uh, for, for more data dependent uh, policy. 
So in this context, we ask uh, three research questions, if you may. So the first is how, how does Fed responsiveness, responsiveness to changes in the US economy, what we refer to as Fed data dependency fluctuate over time? The second is how do financial markets in other countries react to inflation-driven and employment-driven Fed policy tightening? So when the Fed uh, responds to uh, data, to inflation and employment data, what happens uh, to other countries? That's going to be the main uh, question. And then um, are there differences in responses across countries based on macroeconomic fundamentals? That, that, uh, that would be the third question. Uh, so we focus on inflation and employment uh, data releases because obviously the Fed has the dual mandate of uh, maximum employment and uh, low and stable inflation. And so we believe those are the two most important data points uh, to, uh, that inform us about future monetary policy uh, in the US. And I just want to say that uh, I'm sure you, you know this, but today there is a, a key announcement, the non-farm payroll employment uh, net change, and that will be released on 8.30 New York time. So it will be night here, markets will be closed. But based on uh, our analysis, we expect that if the release is deeper substantially from expectations, then on Monday we should see uh, large movements also here in Thailand and uh, in other economies in the region. So to answer the questions that outlined um, uh, before, we uh, adopt a novel methodolo methodological approach. So we focus on US uh, data releases rather than Fed meetings. So our question is how do uh, financial markets, international financial markets react to data dependent monetary policy changes by the Fed. Most studies have focused usually on Fed meetings uh, to, uh, to, to, to study the spillovers of Fed policy, but we argue that the spillovers happen around the data releases, especially when the Fed is data dependent. And that is because investors look at the data release and then uh, anticipate how the Fed is going to respond to the data release. So data releases at times of high data dependence, like now, are informative about future monetary policy. And that's when uh, the reactions, the market reactions are felt uh, more than at, at the time of the Fed meetings, because unless the Fed surprise the market with some uh, uh, unexpected move. Um, however, the second bullet here um, point out that uh, economic data releases have two types of uh, information content. So they inform about future monetary policy, but they also, of course, inform about the economy. And these two can have different impact on financial markets. Uh, now, let's, let's imagine, let's, for instance, think about employment data releases. Uh, a, data, a positive employment release, so when employment, is, uh, employment growth is faster than expected, should, have, uh, should lead investors to reassess the state of the US economy and potentially of its trading partner. And that should be good news uh, for stock markets, for instance, because stronger labor market increases uh, cons uh, cons uh, purchasing power, and that should uh, be good for at least certain uh, companies. However, if the same news leads investors to expect that the Fed will raise interest rates in response to the news, uh, then higher interest rates uh, could be uh, bad for uh, stock markets and therefore could have a negative effect. So crucially, this second channel, the strength of this second channel depends on the degree to which the Fed will respond to the news which is not constant over time, we will see later. And so what we do is, is we uh, construct new measures of Fed data dependency that help us to disentangle uh, between the, the two channels that I just uh, described, between the real economy and the, monet and the monetary policy channel of uh, data releases. Constructing this uh, measure of data dependency and also attentiveness to inflation and employment data because that also varies over time, 
uh, then we can also answer the uh, the first research question, which which is whether there are fluctuations and how these fluctuations look like over time in data dependency. Uh, in the analysis, our focus is on uh, uh, spillovers to 108 economies, uh, including uh, all uh, advanced economies, emerging markets, frontier markets, standalone markets, and uh, uh, markets which are not classified as in any of these categories, but however are, are ADB uh, member economies. And we will look at uh, bond yields, exchange rates versus the dollar, default probabilities, stock markets, and then uh, portfolio debt uh, inflows into a smaller set of emerging market economies for which uh, that data is, uh, is available. Now, I'll, I'll give you a preview of the results. Um, the first uh, uh, result, which is rather a, a stylized fact, is that data dependency varies greatly over time. Uh, it tends to be low when uh, uh, the Fed is at the zero lower bound, uh, and it tends to increase around turning points. So with turning points, I mean, when, when there is a switch uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the cycle. So before starting new easing cycles, or before starting new tightening cycle, we see increases in data dependency, maybe because there is more uncertainty. And so data uh, is more informative. Uh, then, in terms of uh, empirical results, we find that uh, an expected uh, uh, data-driven tightening of monetary policy negatively impact uh, international financial markets and leads to tighter financial conditions. Um, we see uh, interest rates increase, increases, currencies depreciating versus the dollar, and the uh, default probabilities to increase. Um, and stock markets to, to decline. Uh, I, I say expected data-driven Fed tightening because what we, are, what we are actually analyzing is the effect of the expected uh, response to the data release before that, that response uh, uh, actually takes place. So it's, uh, it's about expectations. Uh, the third key result is that uh, strong fundamentals reduce spillovers. And this is, I think, similar to uh, what, uh, what is the consensus in the, in the literature. Um, now let's move on to the contribution of this analytical chapter to the literature. I'm sure you know that there are a lot of studies that uh, look at the spillover effects of uh, Fed policy. Um, however, most of these studies focus on exogenous monetary policy changes. So when there, is a, when there are shifts in the Fed reaction function, rather than data-driven or endogenous changes in, uh, in Fed policy. Uh, there are a couple of exceptions that I'm aware of um, and, uh, and that they study the effects of growth shocks and inflation shocks. So when the Fed... Uh, raise interest rates in response to faster growth or faster inflation, but they still focus on uh, Fed meetings. So they identify these growth shocks and uh, inflation shocks looking at Fed meetings. Whereas we, 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 we argue that those type of shock, the effect of those type of shocks is anticipated at the time of the data release. These studies find that growth shocks have kind of neutral effect for uh, emerging markets. Whereas our results uh, suggest that even when the Fed responds to faster employment growth, we still find negative effects. So that's our contribution in terms of uh, results relative to the current literature. In terms of, of methodology, it's, this is the first study that looks at the data releases uh, to identify data-driven uh, shocks or ch changes in monetary policy. In the rest of the presentation, I will now outline a conceptual framework to think about those issues, then uh, measure Fed, how, how we measure Fed data dependency and uh, present some stylized facts regarding data dependency over time. Then I'll present the empirical results and uh, conclude, uh, sorry, the methodology, the empirical methodology, empirical results, and then conclude with a scenario analysis of what could happen to um, financial conditions depending on different evolution of uh, U.S. inflation and employment in the coming months, based on our empirical results. 
again, if there are questions, yeah, please. So just just to clarify, I think um, from the last uh, page when you talked about you know um, the study that look at the, the effect of Fed on on financial condition, most of them basically look at exogenous shock simply because I think they they try to take care of identification problems, right? Now when you start looking at the um, data driven, which is endogenous shock, I wonder how would you take care of that identification problem, especially endogeneity. Yes, exactly. That's that's the reason why they they focus on exogenous shock identification. So in our framework, we will we look at data releases, and the identification comes from surprises in data releases. So anytime that there is a deviation of the actual release from from what the market expected the release to be, then you have a exogenous shock, if you may, in the in the data release, because that's uh, unanticipated shock to economic conditions and then and then we have that's where the identification comes we interact uh, I will describe that later uh, but we interact the this measure of data dependency which uh, allows us to assess uh, how the Fed is expected to react to the surprise in the data release so given that the surprise is uh, is you can you can see that as a white noise an exogenous shock then we have exogenous shocks, but it's a, they are about um, inflation and uh, and employment. Um, let, let let me know if this this clarifies. But uh, we will uh, look at it a bit later, uh, more in, in detail. Can, in, in your measure, can you distinguish whether the Fed react to the surprise of the news or the market reactions of the news? So in the the analysis is going to be about uh, the market reactions to the expected response of the Fed to the news. So we, we don't observe uh, uh, the Fed response to the news. We observe uh, the effect of the expectations of that response. And uh, I think that also addresses the, the identification problem. So the literature, when they focus on Fed meetings, they look at actual decision by the Fed. So they have to identify the exogenous decision. But here we are looking at the time of the release. So there is no actual Fed action. There is just that the, the release that happened. But the expectation of the Fed action uh, after the release uh, drives uh, the responses. And uh, and because we look at this uh, deviation of the release from the expectation, we have that measure of uh, the um, uh, of that give us the the, the shock. Um, but we'll we'll get there uh, at the methodology part. Uh, there are more questions. Okay, so the conceptual framework. It's um, I. Here, I mean, I, I'm sure that most of you, all of you, know uh, why the Fed, why Fed policy is important to um, other countries, particularly emerging markets, uh, and uh, that's here these three channels. So there are three traditional channels of monetary policy: portfolio rebalancing. So by shifting uh, U.S. interest rates, the Fed drives a differential between. Uh, um, uh, interest rates in the US and in foreign countries, and that differential moves uh, investment uh, across borders. Then there is the risk taking channel. The, the Fed policy can affect the risk appetite by investors, and therefore, there that could have uh, spillovers uh, for, for markets that are considered more or less risky uh, than the US. So, when usually, when, when there was QE, for instance, quantitative easing, that seem to have lower risk aversion and led to higher inflows of capital into uh, riskier emerging markets. And then there is the exchange rate channel, uh, according to which Fed policy um, affect the US dollar exchange rate, uh, and that can have a lot of uh, effects in, in other economies, for instance, through uh, US dollar denominated debt. Uh, so there are 
variation in, in the USD exchange rate uh, affects the uh, repayment uh, uh, or, or default probability on those debts. So these are the three traditional channels of, uh, of uh, monetary policy. And uh, usually the view is that the Fed decides policy at the meetings, and then there are uh, spillovers uh, through, through these three channels um, uh, on, uh, on financial variables in other countries. Uh, what we argue is that these actually these spillovers are anticipated at the time in which uh, there are economic data releases here. So there is an economic data release, and if the Fed is very data dependent, as it is now, investors adjust expectations about Fed policy and do not wait until the meeting uh, to, then, uh, to then adjust their portfolios and through the, through the usual channels uh, impact uh, foreign countries. So there is this anticipation. Um, from data release, uh, investors adjust expectations about future Fed policy, and then the reaction uh, take place. However, data releases also inform about the state of the US economy. So they, have, they can have direct effects on financial markets by uh, shifting perceptions about the state of the US economy. So that's, that's our second arrow, arrow uh, from data release investor adjust the views on the US economy, and that might have uh, effect, direct effects on uh, financial variables. Uh, so I think the traditional literature would be fine if, uh, if the Fed was not data dependent or if the reaction function of the Fed is not known. So in that case, if the reaction function is not known, you see a data release, but you don't know how the Fed will respond to the release and therefore you don't see any effect of the release itself on, on markets. You need to wait until the Fed meeting to, uh, to see what the Fed will do. But if uh, investors know the, the reaction function of the Fed and the Fed has told investors that it is very data, de that is data dependent, then uh, there is this anticipation, which is what we are going to focus on. Now, why do I say that uh, Fed data dependency fluctuate uh, a lot? Because the Fed on communication can shape uh, uh, shapes uh, data dependency. Uh, here we have three quotes from uh, FOMC statements at different point in times. So in the first one, uh, we have a quote from just after the uh, great financial crisis in 2009. The Fed is saying that um, the federal funds rate will be low for an extended period of time. So there is a, a signal that, that and in, at that time the, the, the policy rate was at zero or close to zero, and the Fed is saying it will be close to zero for an extended period of time. So investors know that the Fed is not going to raise or reduce the interest rates, reduce it was impossible because it was zero lower bound, it could not raise the interest rate, uh, or at least that's what the Fed said it will not do. So in, if we move forward uh, a couple of years, August uh, 2011, the Fed uh, introduces even stronger language uh, in that direction. So they say, that uh, the economic conditions are likely to warrant exceptionally low levels for the federal funds rate, at least to, through late 2014. Uh, and it was in August 2011, so that means three years uh, in which investors could expect no change in interest rates. So in these periods in which there is this kind of forward guidance by the Fed, um, you, you don't expect data releases to be very informative about future monetary policy because uh, you know from the Fed that uh, that policy is not going to change. So data dependency is low in those periods. That's what we argue. Um, the latest quote is more recent from June 2023. Here they say that in determining the extent of additional policy firming that may be appropriate to return inflation to 2%, the committee will take into account economic and financial development. So economic and financial developments is economic data and financial developments. They are saying 
future increases in interest rates depend on what the data tells us. If inflation stays, doesn't go down, then we will increase uh, rates uh, more. And so that means that uh, data at that point in time is uh, very informative for future monetary policy. So the problem is how this is just statements. How can we measure uh, quantitatively data dependency? So we uh, we adopt a, a market-based approach, uh, essentially, uh, taking the absolute difference uh, between the one-year forward uh, federal funds rate and the, car and the current effective federal funds rate. The idea is that uh, when we have statements such as the first two forward guidance statements shown in the first slides, uh, that those statements depress expectations of uh, uh, monetary policy changes. And so the difference between these one year, one year future Fed funds and the current Fed funds is very small. And that signal very low data dependency. When there is a large difference, uh, it's because we know from the Fed that the, the Fed might uh, act in the future, might change policy in the future. But importantly, the Fed always issues conditional statements. So it never says, uh, almost never says, we are going to increase interest rates uh, 25 basis points at each meeting, no matter what. It's always conditional on data. So there is a general expectation that the Fed will change policy, but the data, the exact data point, will inform how this expectation will actually materialize. So it will affect the, the timing and the pace of uh, the change in Fed policy. Then I mentioned before that uh, we also look at uh, attentiveness to inflation and employment uh, data releases, and we measure that as absolute gaps from target. In other words, when inflation is, is very, uh, uh, very above or below target, then the Fed will pay more attention to inflation and vice versa with uh, employment. Now, a couple of important stylized facts. I, the first one I mentioned, uh, I think uh, Fed data dependency varies widely over time. This is Fed data dependency over time by year, actually, to make it easier to, uh, you know, to, to, to not see the you know, daily fluctuations. Um, and we see that it tends to be low when there is a zero lower bound, like here, but in particular when the Fed issued that kind of forward, strong forward guidance statement in 2011 and 2012, and also during COVID. So it tends to go down when there is a, the, the zero lower bound, and it, ten, it tends to go up around turning points. So this 20, 2015 was, if you remember, the year of the first uh, rate hike since before the global financial crisis. 2018 was the end of the hiking cycle. 2022 was the beginning of a new hiking cycle, and 2024 is the beginning of the easing cycle. So at turning points, uh, Fed data dependency seems to uh, increase, maybe because there is more uncertainty regarding the future evolution and data is more informative. Then in the right-hand chart, uh, we see, I think, a very important stylized fact. So we compare uh, the standard deviation of changes in, uh, in the one-year future, let's say, standard deviation of uh, monetary policy expectations, to, to make it easier, in days of inflation releases, employment data releases, and Fed meetings. And we see that actually monetary policy expectations move as much in days of employment and inflation data releases as in days of Fed meetings. So there, this is telling us that data releases as in, are as important for future monetary policy as days of Fed meeting themselves. But I will add that for data-driven changes, which is what we are interested in, the, the days of inflation and the employment data releases are likely to be more important uh, than Fed meetings because, as, as, as noted before, Fed meetings move the rates also because of exogenous changes in, in, uh, in interest rates. In other words, what the other paper tried to identify. So in Fed, may, in Fed meeting days, you have exogenous and endogenous change in interest rates. And, and overall, they give you this movement in monetary policy expectations. This is just about data-driven changes in interest rates. Okay, And, and so I think to, for data-driven changes, most of the reaction happens, uh, is anticipated around days of data releases. And then the other key stylized fact is that 
these data releases move market expectations much more in times of high data dependency with the green bar than in times of low data dependency when when uh, when uh, uh, they're supposed to be not informative for monetary policy, which I think makes sense. Okay, now let me go to the regression specification. Uh, the regression specification is an ev event study approach. So we uh, we have the change in the variable of interest uh, on a two-day window. Uh, because uh, Asian markets are closed uh, at the time of data releases in the US, so we expect the responses the following day. And in the right hand side, we have uh, a measure of the economic news, which will give us the exogeneity of the shock. So it's not the data release, but the difference with expectations. I'll be more precise about that later. Then we have Fed, our measure of Fed data dependency and then the interaction between the news and the Fed data dependency. Uh, here there is a, a type of this parenthesis should go here. Uh, the interaction term gives us essentially how much the Fed is expected to respond to the, to the news. And so that's the key, that, that's the, this, this theta coefficient is the coefficient of interest that will tell us how financial markets in other countries will respond to the release of uh, data in the US on the expectation that the Fed will respond to it. Um, I think that's it. So uh, yeah, the financial markets, uh, the, the variables of interest are the stock market index, bond yield, exchange rate, et cetera. And uh, we have a daily panel, of course, and it's estimated with OLS and uh, standard errors are, are clustered at the time and country level. Um, now, uh, measurement of economic news. We, this is important for the exogeneity of the shock. So as I explained before, market participants do not react to a data release, uh, but they react to the deviation of the release from, what, from their expectations. So if, if today you expect the employment report to be, to be 200,000, 200,000 jobs created in the US and then the release is 300,000, then that's a big surprise. Uh, that means the labor market is growing faster than expected and that's what will give uh, the, that, what, that is what will prompt the market reaction. And that component is uh, unanticipated. Um, so, after taking this uh, deviation, we standardize it by the standard deviation of the same deviation to express this news in terms of standard deviation surprises. So the coefficient will measure uh, the effect of one standard deviation surprise. And these are the results. Um, um, so the general result is that, again, unexpected data-driven tightening of, of monetary policy in the US negatively affects debt, currency, and stock markets. But looking more into in, in detail, in these graphs, we decompose the effect of the, of the surprise in two components. The direct effect that works through the way in which uh, investors reassess the state of the US economy, and then the component of the expected Fed response uh, to the surprise. And uh, uh, statistically significant coefficients are denoted by darker colored uh, uh, bars. So I just want to point out that here in terms of the, the effect of the, the direct effect of surprise uh, should be blue, but it's uh, kind of gray because they are not statistically significant. Uh, whereas uh, uh, in all cases except uh, one here, the, the, the effect of the expected Fed response is statistically significant. And then the diamonds give the overall effect. Um, of course, we had the, to make a choice here. So we are showing uh, results for high levels of uh, Fed data dependency. When data dependency is at the 90th uh, percentile of the distribution. And that is, we, sh we choose this percentile because it's what we have observed uh, on average in 2024. So it's uh, essentially the current uh, context. So we are in a time of high data dependency and that's what we should expect from uh, inflation and employment surprises. 
So let's look at employment just because today is the day of the employment release. So uh, maybe it's easier to then uh, compare what will actually happen uh, uh, on Monday. Uh, when there is a one standard deviation surprise, which is about 100,000 um, more jobs created than expected, uh, we see that uh, bond deals go, go up short term by about four basis points. And it's totally driven by the expected Fed response to the news. Uh, the exchange rate, uh, uh, the USD appreciate by about 0.2%. And then we find not statistically significant effect on the stock markets. Whereas for inflation, there are similar effects, uh, but additionally, we find this effect on the stock market. Um, um, then here, there are other dependent variables, uh, the 10-year government bond yield, the default probability and portfolio debt inflows to emerging markets. Um, the results are in line to what shown before, but uh, uh, they are less consistent. So sometimes we find significant uh, results like here, significant uh, responses like here, sometimes not. Um, I, in particular, I want to focus on this one. Why, why is it the case that the 10-year yield uh, respond to an employment surprise, uh, but not to an inflation surprise? Uh, we, we think this might be because the, the Fed does a response to employment surprises with a lag. Uh, it's not that there is a surprise today and then when the Fed next meets, uh, there is a change in monetary policy, but rather it affects the path of future interest rates. Whereas with inflation, the responses could be more uh, uh, in the near term. Um, so now to we 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 kind of quantify how uh, important these effects that the effects that we estimate are by doing scenario analysis. And so essentially we use the coefficients estimated uh, to um, do some back of the envelope calculations uh, to see how financial markets uh, in the world uh, could be affected under different inflation and employment scenarios in the remainder of this year. So October, actually September, because we don't have yet September data, September, October, November, and December of this year. So we still have four important data releases for non-farm payroll employment and inflation. And depending on those releases will influence the expected path of uh, pace of the Fed easing. Um, so in a scenario in which uh, U.S. inflation rebounds to 2.9% by end of, uh, of July. So there is a U.S. inflation rebound scenario. 2.9% was the level in July. Now it's 2.5%. It may be unlikely, but it could still happen. In that scenario, we calculate that short-term foreign bond deals could go up by 70 basis points. Uh, foreign currencies could depreciate 4 percent versus the dollar and stock markets could decrease by 5.5 percent and government default probabilities could go up by about three percentage points then there is also the possibility that the the u.s economy actually slows down more than expected and uh, we calculate that we uh, in particular we do a scenario in which inflation almost reach target by the end of this year and uh, there is a serious uh, slowdown in the US job market, labor market. So in that case, short term uh, bond deals could decrease by about a full percentage points in other countries uh, and uh, local currencies and stock markets could, could appreciate by four to five percent and government default probabilities could decrease. Um, so depending on the evolution of the US economy, if the US economy evolves as expected, then there should be no changes in, uh, in uh, financial conditions because there is no uh, change in the expected path of the Fed policy rate. If instead the US will, conditions will evolve very differently from current expectations, we could see very strong uh, responses in financial conditions, including uh, in, uh, in the region. Um, 
Finally, in a final exercise, we look at uh, uh, the role of uh, macroeconomic fundamentals. In particular, we look at whether there is uh, heterogeneity in responses depending on um, uh, the current account balance, fiscal balance, inflation, GDP growth, uh, um, the external debt, and uh, the credit rating. And uh, we see that countries that uh, score worse in these metrics uh, tend to see higher spillovers from data dependent uh, uh, Fed policies. Um, in particular, this is the response of to employment differences in the responses to employment surprises. Uh, we see that uh, countries with a higher inflation see larger responses of government bond yields and of the exchange rate. And uh, external debt and uh, lower credit rating also uh, affect the response of long-term bond yields. Um, and I think uh, that's it from my uh, side. So I hope you uh, you enjoyed and uh, th there, are, there are a few minutes for the discussion. Uh, thank you, Gabriel. It's a very nice presentation. Uh, for my questions, uh, first, uh, I, I, I want to know about identification. So uh, how do you separate effects between uh, investor and just uh, U.S. E economies for cutting between uh, or investing at just monetary policy of Fed? Uh, expectation in, in, in your uh, uh, regressions. Uh, the next is how do you deal uh, about endogeneity between uh, unemployment rate in the Philip curve that can influence inflation in, in, in the future? So when employment have released, so investor maybe uh, expect about inflation as well. So the Fed or the 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 Fed fund future can I I I wonder but like market may be confused about in uh, information about unemployment rate and, and inflation, uh, yeah. And the last of my question is your presentation about scenario is very nice, but I think probability to right now to to uh, current situation is supply shocks because you uh, you you present in, in the first uh, page like uh the operating tensions uh have widened so supply shock i i think is very important right now so your scenario is separate between economics inflation i, I think supply shock is uh different sign of of your your scenario I, I i i want to know about if the us face supply shocks to to the us economy how to fed react and market react thank you Yeah, actually, my my question is related to the his second question. Like, I in in your first slide, you mentioned about like for example, like the climate shock, like things like that, right? So I was wondering whether like in this framework or the methodology that you're using, could it be extended to look at other type of data apart from inflation and unemployment? So that is my first question. The second one, like um, in in the detail report, like um, do you also show, so show the um, the different um, spillover effects on different um, types of uh, um, group of countries as well, or is it only as a part of the scenario that you presented? Uh, final slide. So. I think you are trying to argue um, on using the data dependency as as a as an important channel in in your spillover. 
but then you construct the data, the data dependency measure as a one year future Fed fund rate subtracted by the current Fed fund rate. And I would argue that that's actually um, just reflects um, the up cycle of the economy, right? So, so, so I mean, instead of telling the story of channel by which the extent of data driven of the Fed affect the spillovers from the unexpected shocks. You can also alternatively telling a story of how the spillover from expected shocks differ from different business cycle, or or like like if it's, it's gonna grow like the spillover through this channel is gonna be higher if you have the economy during the end up cycle with high uncertainty, right? So so I would want to hear your view on that, or or if you have control for all this business cycle and uncertainty in the regression that you estimate the channel of um, the data driven. Thank you. Oh. Would you like to respond now or actually we have one more question from the chat room. Okay. Okay, so I guess we will take all the question and then maybe you can respond to whichever. Okay, so for from the um, audience in online, so he said, thank you for this interesting piece. He has two questions. One, how would you resolve? How would your results change if I replace the Fed dependency variable by a communication based measure? like how often they mention data dependency. And then the second question, um, you mentioned greater spillovers could signify weak fundamentals. Taibat is very volatile right now. Could you comment on that? <laughs> okay, and then we'll take last question and then. Um, so first of all, thank you for a very interesting and insightful presentation. Um, my question is, is sort of more related to financial stability and systemic risk. So I'm just wondering, like um, you talk about um, spillovers to like some variables like bond yields and other things, but um, what's your view or like what's the implication to financial stability and systemic risk for like a certain country, for example, that you see from your perspective. Thank you. Okay, so <clears throat> thank you for the great questions uh, um, received. So I will respond uh, to them not in order of importance, but you know, we'll try to address uh, all. Um, maybe start. Maybe go. I will go through in order in which I have received them, except for the first one on which uh, the very first one on which I need some um, uh, further clarification. But let me respond to the second question of the first uh, uh, of the first uh, uh, person. So your second question on the supply shocks. There could be uh, essentially the question is there could be supply shocks uh, in the U.S. and uh, the, the scenario should speak about that. So uh, um, I agree. Uh, we see the yeah geopolitical uh, tension, so oil oil price shocks. Uh, th there was a strike in the US ports, which has been resolved, but might resurface uh, in the future. So those shocks, I think, to the extent that uh, increase uh, uh, prices uh, are reflected in the, uh, in the first uh, scenario. So you can see a supply side shock as uh, increasing increasing inflation uh, and potentially also lowering uh, growth, and so that would be the the, the first scenario, rebounding uh, inflation scenario. Uh, of course, here we have taken a you know a, a bit arbitrary level, uh, so we did not link exactly to the effect of the supply shocks. But I think to qualitatively, the effect of supply shocks will fall uh, into this category. Um, uh, then the, the, there was a question on other data. So we look at all in inflation and employment data uh, releases, 
and the question is whether there were also other data that are in, uh, that are important uh, yes uh, the fed looks at a variety of data uh, to inform uh, its uh, its monetary policy path um, but um, in terms of uh, importance those two are probably the most important because they speak directly to the fed mandate and also because they are released uh, early in the month so the financial market impact of data releases is magnified um, for releases that are timely and for instance non-farm payroll employment is the first friday of every month regarding the prior month so it's one of the first releases and that um, makes it more important so we are fo uh, uh, focusing on on the two for these reasons uh, but you know potentially this could be extended to other types of data um, i think an obvious candidate are financial uh, uh, shocks if there are financial shocks so, so we know that fed policy is part response to financial developments and so uh, that could be uh, another type of data but then the exogeneity so identification of the shock is more pro problematic because there is we don't have expectation of uh, financial developments uh, uh, then there, whether there are um, results in the report by group of countries yes so we divide between uh, um, uh, developed markets and emerging and frontier market economies and we see that uh, the responses are qualitatively similar um, I think there are slightly higher responses in developed markets and we uh, argue we also tested for it uh, but that's not shown in the chapter but we tested and that depends on the fact that uh, developed markets are usually more uh, they have more open capital account uh, they are more capitalized and so they're more sensitive but we see uh, similar responses in emerging markets uh, frontier markets and also in developing asia interesting in, de in developing asia china exhibits exhibits quite muted responses and asian economies exhibit uh, more consistent responses to relative to the other group of uh, countries um, then there was a question on the measurement of data dependency that could reflect uh, uh, actually the business cycle uh, you know, I, we got the same comment actually by the our chief economist, so it's a very valid uh, uh, remark. Uh, and I and uh, I would uh, I have two answers. So the first, remember that we measure uh, data dependency as uh, the absolute difference between the one year ahead uh, future rate and the current effective rate. So the absolute difference, uh, in a way, addresses that because it's given that it's the absolute difference is not more about business cycle but maybe it's just about an uncertainty of so uncertainty in the uh, in the direction of the fed policy or actually i would say that's also not i don't think that because it's it's uh, expectation of the future policy relative to the current uh, uh, policy so it's when you have when you have expectation that there is a large change but it's not a it's not about the direction of the change so that's what i mean to that's what i want to say the extent of the change yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, I mean, uh, we in one of the I think it's uh, again it's a valid point, and in one of the um, robustness checks we we introduce a measure of a business cycle and we as a control variable and uh, we um, and we also have uh, uh, the the first difference in uh, in that measure so the change in the business cycle that could partly maybe address uh, your concern um, the results are, are very similar uh, but uh, i think um, and that this response to another question uh, the next step in this uh, project is to measure uh, data dependency through uh, text uh, text analysis of fed communication 
So in that case, um, uh, so that's what, what we are going to do uh, in the near future. Then we, when we have a text-based analysis of uh, Fed data dependency, then um, I think then we would have a more measure of actual data dependency. And one could even uh, check uh, whether the results hold to controlling for this other measure uh, of market market based measure that we have now. So the measure that you you say, I think rightly so, could also be uh, driven by other things. So this is a uh, uh, work in progress uh, in a way, but we issued this, you know, the timing of the ADO is very uh, strict. Uh, so we issued that, but we will continue working on this. So this uh, answer my question on, there was, I think, another, uh, there was a question on whether it shouldn't be, be we could use communication-based measures. So yes, the answer is yes. And we are working on that. Um, and then there was a question on the on the fundamentals and uh, uh, in Thailand, uh, in particular. So uh, I, I I don't have the numbers in my end, but I think in Thailand the inflation rate at the moment is uh, quite low. Uh, so in a way that uh, is uh, re reassuring because uh, we see that inf having higher inflation amplifies the spillover. So having low inflation should uh, uh, weaken the spillovers. I don't know uh, about, uh, I think there is also the lower growth uh, rate. So Thailand doesn't have a particularly high growth rate. So that might uh, uh, increase uh, the spillover. So it's a bit mixed, uh, mixed picture in that respect. Uh, I don't know about the external debt. Maybe you know better than me. Um, but that that uh, if it's high, then we would have a, a higher spillover in the on the debt markets. Um, and uh, implications for financial stability. Uh, so I, I think uh, our results on uh, on currencies and ex uh, bond yields and uh, exchange rate uh, speak a little bit about uh, that. In particular, uh, if you have high external debt, so that denominated in uh, in uh, hard currencies, USD, Euro, etc., then you are very exposed, and uh, therefore countries that have they 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 could uh, they could suffer more. There could be a uh, increase in the probability of of a financial crisis, but we we don't uh, uh, test for that uh, directly because it's uh, uh, if you know a way. To do it, uh, let, let's let's talk after the seminar because it would be interesting. But uh, in general, yeah, um, remember these are surprises. So sometimes surprise go in one direction, sometimes in the other. But uh, if there are repeated uh, surprise in one direction, then we will have the the risks. Um, yeah, there was another question, but uh, let's maybe uh, uh, speak uh, continue later. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone, for the question um, and for joining. And I would like to thank you, Gabriel, today for a very interesting and relevant talk. So let's give a round of applause to him. <laughs>